Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our program today entitled Investigating Employee Misconduct in the Nonprofit Workplace. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice here at the Venable Law Firm. Uh, thank you for joining us for this program, which is part of the monthly series that we've been doing for over six years now on a wide variety of nonprofit legal topics. Uh, and welcome to the, uh, I know it's well over 200 of you who have joined us from around the country on the webinar portion of today's program. Uh, today's program, we'll get to the substance of it uh, in a few minutes as well as to our speakers, uh, but a few housekeeping tips first. Uh, as many of you know, all of the six years worth of uh, recorded uh, uh, programs that we've done, including today's, are all recorded and we host them on a YouTube channel. The uh, link to that is on the last page of today's PowerPoint slide. So if you're ever interested in learning more about any different nonprofit legal topics, uh, feel free to visit that uh, pretty large collection of uh, recorded webinars. Uh, today's program um, I'm particularly excited about. I, 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 we cover uh, many, many different types of legal topics in these monthly programs, uh, but we try to spend probably two out of the 12 every year focused on employment-related topics. Uh, they always tend to be very well attended, as you can see here today. Um, and they always tend to be very interesting, very nuanced, very complex, very difficult. They involve legal issues and, and a lot of non-legal issues as well. Um, and they tend to be some of the thorniest and trickiest that nonprofits have to deal with. They also tend to carry with them some of the greatest liability risk. Uh, and so they're certainly very important topics to, uh, to cover as well. And you have two terrific speakers here um, who uh, I'll introduce uh, in a few minutes. A few uh, housekeeping tips first. Uh, for those of you in the trade and professional association community, uh, these programs are eligible for um, CAE, Continuing Education Credit. Uh, preview of, sorry, clicker is definitely not working well today. A few uh, uh, preview of our uh, scheduled upcoming programs. We have three scheduled uh, for the next three months. And yes, we do work as lawyers at Venable in the uh, summer months and have programs in July and August and actually have gotten some pretty good attendance. So we hope you will join us either in person or online. Uh, on July 11th, our program is entitled Working Effectively with Outside Counsel, What Every Nonprofit Should Know. Uh, two terrific speakers for that program, and I'm really excited for that one. Um, on August 17th, our program is entitled Key Trademark and Copyright Developments Around the World, Implications for Nonprofits in China, Europe, Cuba, and Beyond. I'm sure like many of you, uh, many of your uh, nonprofit organizations are increasingly active overseas. It's been an ever-growing part of our nonprofit practice for years now. Um, and uh, of course, we have a, a large practice in the intellectual property area and trademark and copyright issues, but the work that we've been doing with many nonprofits around the world in, in certain countries in particular uh, really warrants what I think is going to be a terrific program on August 17th. And finally, on September 20th, these days, we always devote at least one program a year uh, to uh, federal, uh, federal funding issues, federal grant and contract issues for nonprofits. There's no shortage of them. The rules in this area have gotten increasingly complex, particularly for federal grantees compared to what things used to be. And the uh, federal agencies and their inspector general's offices have gotten more aggressive than ever on the enforcement front, as have other agencies like DOJ. So this is a, a, a terrific program. I hope they can hear me. The microphone seemed to go silent. Um, okay, in terms of uh, handout materials, those of you in the room have a handout book that has a copy of today's PowerPoint slides, uh, along with full bios of our speakers and some related articles on some ancillary employment law topics. Uh, those of you on the webinar uh, received a copy of the PowerPoint deck uh, linked to the confirmation email you received. And all of you tomorrow will receive an email that contains a link to the recording of today's program along with all of the handout materials and PowerPoint slides and bios. And feel free to share that with colleagues and others uh, who may benefit from that. And of course, all of our uh, recorded webinars and all of our articles and handout materials and everything else are all posted on our website. The links you can find at the end of um, today's uh, PowerPoint deck. In terms of questions today, those of you in the room, we encourage you to ask, we encourage all of you to ask questions throughout the program. Raise your hand if you have a question and someone will come around to you with a microphone. Please wait until the mic comes so everyone on the phone can hear your questions. Those of you on the webinar, please pose your questions to me using the chat feature 
uh, on the uh, webinar software, and I'll pose those to our speakers uh, at the appropriate times. Now, for our speakers themselves, to my immediate right is Doug Miskin. Uh, Doug is a partner in Venable's Labor and Employment Group uh, and has spent the last 30 years uh, litigating and counseling nonprofits and other uh, for-profit organizations in the employment law area. He is a terrific employment lawyer. I've had the privilege of working with Doug only for about the last year and a half or so. Um, he happens to work with many, many nonprofits, including that predated his joining Venable. So he has a, a keen understanding of kind of how these employment law issues play out in the um, in the nonprofit sector. Uh, he's a very uh, fun and, and amusing uh, speaker to listen to. I've uh, done a number of speaking presentations and trainings for some of our nonprofit clients on different employment topics, uh, and you're going to benefit ter uh, tremendously from his comments and insights here today. And Doug used to be at another large uh, law firm in D.C. where he worked closely with Alyssa Senzel, who's our other speaker to my far right. They have actually done this presentation, or a, 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 a somewhat longer versions of it, um, a number of times in the past. And so we, we thought we would reunite them and bring them back and do a nonprofit version of this presentation for today's program. Uh, it's, it's really a delight to have Alyssa Sensel here. She is Deputy General Counsel and Compliance Officer for the company Blackboard, a uh, for-profit company, but a company that works with uh, many, many, many nonprofit organizations. She advises Blackboard on a full range of employment issues, both domestic and international, and also oversees the company's corporate compliance program. She's been with Blackboard since June of 2005. Prior to that, she was up counsel with Patton Boggs, uh, where she focused on employment counseling, training, and litigation. I'm really excited to have both of them, Doug and Alyssa, here today. And without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Doug to get us started. Doug. So the point of our program today can be reduced to the story of the four doctors who went on a hunting trip. We had the internist, the psychiatrist, the surgeon, and the pathologist all standing by the lake when a bird flew overhead. So the internist picks up his shotgun and aims, but doesn't shoot. The other said, why didn't you shoot? He said, well, it looked like a duck and it sounded like a duck, but I'd really have to run a few more tests to be sure. Okay. Next bird flies overhead. The surgeon picks up her, I'm sorry, the psychiatrist picks up her shotgun and aims, but doesn't shoot. The other said, why not? She said, well, it looked like a duck and it sounded like a duck, but I'd really have to know how it felt about its parents to be sure. <laughs> Next bird flies overhead. The surgeon picks up his shotgun, aims, shoots, a bird falls to the ground. He turns to the pathologist and says, go see if it's a duck. <laughs> When it comes to doing investigations of employee misconduct in the workplace, we have people who play all of those different roles. We have people who are like the surgeon who like to shoot first and ask questions later. We have people who are like the internist or the psychiatrist who can't seem to make a decision. And then, sadly, we have people who are like the pathologist whose lot in life is to clean up after other people's mistakes. Our point of view that we will impart to you over the next 70 minutes or so is that when it comes time for anybody to be doing an investigation in your workplace, it doesn't have to be any of those ways. Good afternoon. I am Doug Mishkin. With me is my former colleague and I believe still current friend, Alyssa Senzel. And uh, we did indeed, uh, when we practice law together and thereafter, uh, do a version of this training program for about 150 different companies. We are proud to have trained, trained literally thousands of HR professionals. The program that we used to do was an eight-hour program, and that, of course, posed the challenge for today. How do you take an eight-hour program and reduce it to 75 minutes? It was obvious to me and Alyssa the way to do it is cut out the jokes. <laughs> I will note that this is the first time that we have done this presentation sitting down. That may not seem like a lot to you, but to two of us who are used to a lot of gesticulating, let's see how that goes. So we've cut out the jokes, kind of, uh, and we have, of course have had to cut out a lot more. But our focus uh, today really will be on giving you a taste of what we think HR professionals and others who are tasked with investigating employee misconduct ought to know. Uh, but the message beyond that for you is 
to uh, talk to you about why we think it's important that investigators get a training. And I like to think of it uh, like this. If you thought about playing golf, if you hadn't ever played golf before, you could go get a set of clubs, go find a course and start swinging. And you'd put the ball in the cup 18 times eventually. It wouldn't be pretty, but you could do it. Well, what would you do if you wanted to get better? You could talk to somebody who plays golf and I'm sure they could tell you some things that would be helpful. But if you wanted to get really good, what would you do? You'd go get some lessons. And when you got some lessons, you would learn that there really is something to know about things like how do you grip the club? How do you shift your weight when you swing? And what wood or iron do you use for a particular shot? There really is something to know about all of those things. Well, when it comes to doing an investigation, if you've never done one, you could jump right in and give it a shot. Or you could ask somebody who's done some investigations and you could probably learn some things of value. But what would you do if you wanted to get really good at it? You would take some lessons, namely you'd get some training. And when you got some training, you would learn that there really is something to know about things like, when do you do an investigation? What kind of questions do you ask? What order do you ask those questions in? Who do you interview? What order do you interview those people in? How do you assess people's credibility? How do you document what you're doing? How do you use the attorney-client privilege? How do you reach a conclusion? How do you implement that conclusion? And how do you do it all in a way that minimizes your risk of legal liability? Getting proper training will enable your organization to have the benefit of all of those things. And then, of course, there is the pure legal benefit to having your people trained because we now know the investigator who is deposed is going to be asked, what kind of training did you get to do this kind of investigation? So we have a, a, a goal when we train uh, investigators, and, and it's a goal that I want to share uh, because we have it for uh, today as well. We know, and you've probably heard this yourself, you know the phenomenon of somebody who says, you know, I would have taken action against this employee because I think this person engaged in some kind of misconduct. I would have taken action, but I was afraid of what the law might do to us if we took action. So I just want to protect the organization. I'll do right by the organization. I'll do nothing right now. Those of you in the room, don't raise your hand. Those of you listening on the phone, hands down. But I'm willing to bet somewhere here in the room or in the listening audience, there are people who have said that or thought that, and we reject that mentality. Right? We reject that. So our goal in this presentation today is to make you confident and to make your people confident that they can reach a conclusion they're comfortable with in a way that reduces the risk of liability associated with doing an investigation. But why is it that people lack confidence? I'm going to explain by means of a story. It's a story that we were actually involved in many years ago. It, it involved a woman working as a security guard on the night shift in an office building. Her supervisor was a male guard. This was the woman's version of events. She said, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. She said her supervisor stepped out of an elevator onto the floor where she was working. She said the supervisor kind of looked around in what she thought was a suspicious way. And the supervisor steps out and he sees another security guard at the other end of the floor sound asleep. Now, if you're the supervisor on the night shift, what's the one thing you're supposed to make sure the other security guards are not doing? Anybody sleeping, right? Okay. What's the one thing that this supervisor does not do to this sleeping guard? Right. Wake him up. Instead, the woman says, 
the supervisor went over to her side of the floor and motioned her over something about, come over here, I want you to look at this pile of wiring on the floor. So she goes over to look at the pile of wiring, and as she does that, she is now outside the view of the security cameras that are at work on that floor. And when she's outside the view of those security cameras, the supervisor proceeds to sexually assault her. Okay? The assault concludes, the supervisor, he takes off. What about the woman who got assaulted? Does she leave? No. Why? She said, I couldn't. I had to stand guard. I had to stay on my post. She doesn't even tell the company what happened. She does tell her boyfriend who worked for the company. He told the company, and the company appointed an investigator to look into what happened. The investigator was a security guard with the company in management, and he had been in a prior life a police officer. So the investigator gets involved. What does he do? He talks to the woman, and the woman tells him roughly what I just explained to you as her version of events. What's next? He talks to the supervisor. What do you think the supervisor says? No way. Never laid a glove on her. Okay, we have she said and he said. What's next? The, supervisor, the investigator then goes and talks to that third guard, right? He figures he's got a witness. The third guard says, oh, I don't know, it was kind of dark, I couldn't quite see. Sure, he was sound asleep, right? So we have she said, he said, and a guy who is worthless as a witness. So the investigator says, you know, I can't really conclude what happened because, you know, I wasn't there, I didn't see it. So that's pretty much it. End of story, not so fast. The woman then goes down to the police station. She swears out a warrant for the uh, supervisor's arrest for the crime of sexual assault. The police do an investigation, and they conclude insufficient evidence to warrant bringing criminal charges. End of story, not so fast. What happens next? You know what happens next. She sues, right? She sues the, the company and the supervisor for sexual harassment. Now the scene is the, super, the investigator is being prepped for his deposition by his lawyer, and the investigator is not a happy camper. And the investigator says, as you might imagine, hey, I did my best. I did what you're supposed to do. I talked to her. I talked to him. I talked to Sleeping Beauty. But I wasn't there. There's nothing on tape. How am I supposed to know what happened? And, you know, even the police couldn't make out a case against this guy. How was I supposed to be able to prove he did it beyond a reasonable doubt? Stop right there. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, this is what I want you taking away, right? Because this is the most important point. What's wrong here and what's wrong is the investigator did not understand what the law requires of us when we do one of these investigations, and that's what we're gonna talk about now. What's the standard of proof? We have several choices, let's dig in. One possibility, beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? Everybody knows the standard beyond a reasonable doubt. What kind of case do we use beyond a reasonable doubt in? Criminal, criminal case. In a criminal case, the government has to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime. It's a very high standard. It's the highest standard we have. You might say, if you quantified it, you've got to be 99% sure that the defendant did it. And we know that there are people who commit crimes who get off because the government can't meet that high a burden. Is that the standard that we're held to when we do these investigations? No. What's the next possibility? Clear and convincing evidence. Now, clear and convincing evidence is a slightly lower standard, but it's still a very substantial standard. We use beyond, uh, clear and convincing evidence in civil cases that involve fraud or if you're trying to get punitive damages. And the law says, look, that's a serious matter. Uh, you got to be 75% sure that the wrongdoing occurred. Not as high as beyond a reasonable doubt, still it's substantial. Is that the standard that the investigator was held to in the security guard investigation? It's not. And it's not the standard that we're held to uh, when we do internal uh, investigations in the workplace. Well, what's next? Preponderance of the evidence. 
Preponderance of the, of the evidence is the standard we use in most civil lawsuits. So, for example, uh, today after the program, if I were to get in my car and drive into your car, you'd sue me for negligence. And at trial, you'd have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that I was negligent. But for those of you in the room, you know, I'm moving my hands up and down. These are the scales of justice, yes? And preponderance of the evidence means your evidence just tips a little heavier than the other side. So you think of it as having 51% of the evidence. Is that the standard that the investigator was held to in the security guard investigation? It's not. And it's not the standard we're held to when we do a workplace investigation. How do we know this? Because we've got a fourth standard on the list and we didn't put it there for no reason. The fourth standard on your list is what this is all about. It's about doing a good faith investigation and reaching a reasonable conclusion. Good faith investigation, reasonable conclusion. Well, what's a good faith investigation? What do you have to do to do a good faith investigation? That's what the eight hours is about, right? We'll touch on those points, but they are the things that one does to, to do a good faith investigation and to be able to say and to prove that you did a good faith investigation. So you do a good faith investigation and then you reach a conclusion that is reasonable. Now you'll notice I did not say a conclusion that is right. Well, does it not matter whether your conclusion is right? Of course, it's, of course it matters. And all the things that we think you ought to be doing enhance the likelihood that your conclusion will be right. But it's important that you and your people understand that if the investigation is challenged in court, the question that the law will ask is not was your conclusion correct, but rather was your conclusion reasonable? How does this actually work? Well, let's go back to the security guard situation. Remember what the investigator said when he was preparing for his deposition? Even the police couldn't make out a case against this guy. How was I supposed to? Well, what standard are the police held to? Beyond a reasonable doubt, right? The police are in the criminal justice system and eventually it's gonna be beyond a reasonable doubt or not. Now, people sometimes say to us, well, Am I saying that the company could have concluded that the supervisor engaged in the sexual assault even if the police couldn't make out the criminal case against that guy? And the answer is absolutely. That is exactly what I'm saying. It happens all the time. Two different standards, two different results. For an example, and we'll pull this out of what we thought was ancient history, except it's back in the press yet again. Think of the sequence of events in the O.J. Simpson trial. The first trial was what kind of case? It was a criminal case, and who won, right? In the end, the jury concluded that it could not determine beyond a reasonable doubt that Simpson engaged in the killing. But the second case was a civil case brought by the families of the victims, and in that case, the jury found against Simpson because the jury could find by a preponderance of the evidence that he had engaged in the killings. Different standards, different results. And the key thing here is for us all to remember, this is the standard we'll be held to. If the law held us, so the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt in doing our workplace investigations, no employer would ever find that any employee ever engaged in misconduct because we're not the police, right? We don't have the ability to subpoena people and generally don't have the ability to do the kind of testing that the police do. We would never meet that high standard and the law doesn't require it. Why do we even care what standard law applies to us because if you're smart, you or your HR people will say, our employees are at will employees. We can fire them with or without cause, with or without notice. Who cares about meeting any standard? It's a good question, but I got good news for you. I have a really good answer for that question. And the answer goes like this. Every at will employee is still a potential discrimination plaintiff. Every at-will employee has the ability to say, you did this to me because I am a 
fill in the blank, race, national origin, gender, you know all the protected categories. And anybody who brings one of those claims will be in a position where they can say to us, we think you discriminated, and then it's our burden to show what we did and why we did it. Sometimes we have employees who are able to say, you fired me without just cause. And we always have employees who could say, my discharge was a wrongful discharge. In all of those scenarios, our investigation is going to become the heart of our defense and meeting that standard becomes critical. This is why we think it's so important that investigators have the proper skills to do this. Uh, how does your investigation actually begin? Alyssa will discuss. So the issue can come to you in any number of ways. If you've got a hotline set up, it can come through the hotline. It might come to you anonymously. It might come to you via the dreaded knock on the door, especially on a Friday afternoon. However it comes to you, this is the only chance you get to make a good first impression. So it's very important that you, you, if you're doing the investigation, or your investigator knows what they're doing, which is why Doug talked about training being so important. You want this person to trust you. You want this person to have confidence in your organization's process. So right now, the investigator has to demonstrate that they know what they're doing. You will talk to the person long enough, you will instill confidence that yes, thank you for coming to me, you did the right thing by bringing this issue to my attention. And then you've got to figure out what the issue is. You say, well, that's easy, right? Someone will clearly wear a sign around their neck that says, you know, this is an FLSA problem. Not so fast, because you know, someone comes with a problem, they sit down, they're maybe uh, nervous, they're wringing their hands, they're uncomfortable, and they begin to pour forth the weirdest bunch of information you've ever heard. Perhaps they've been at the company a long time, so they're starting back in 1994, and you're desperate to get them to stop talking. Don't get them to stop talking. Let them talk longer than is comfortable for you. Even though you feel like this is a waste of your time, that you've gathered what you need to gather, you don't know what's important at this point because you don't know what the issue is. It's like a law school um, final exam, right? There's all manner of crazy issue spotting. At the end, you can figure out, okay, what's relevant, what's not. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, I got a bad evaluation, if you don't talk to them long enough, you might not hear, oh, hey, I got a bad evaluation. And by the way, about three months ago, my boss was asking me out, and I said no a bunch of times, and now I've gotten a bad evaluation, right? So you've really got to uh, dig in, and you want to ask open-ended questions, right? Uh, journalism, who, what, where, when, and why type questions. There are a couple of specific things. You also want to make sure that you or your investigator gets out of this first meeting, because what you're doing in the first meeting is setting up the roadmap for the rest of the process. You want to figure out, were there any witnesses? Did anyone hear it? Did anyone see it? Has this happened before? Right? Certainly if this person is coming to you as a first time, that's great, but if this has gone on a long time, you absolutely want to know that. Have you told anyone else about it? You want to figure out, okay, those people might or might not be witnesses, but what's the scope of the information that's out there? And then what documents exist? And if you use the word document or if your investigator uses the word document, they're only doing half the job. because. A stressed out employee doesn't necessarily know what a document is. They think it's some kind of company policy. And yeah, sure, it's an organizational policy, but it's also an email. It's the thing you put in your, um, in your address book with a little note about somebody. It's the text message. Those things are all the documents you're looking for. So you're developing a roadmap, and you're going to hear a lot of weird things. But we can tell you that there are certain statements that if you do more than say one investigation, you're likely to hear. And we'll just go right through them. Well, the one thing you're quite likely to hear is, um, look, uh, can, I, uh, can I talk to you? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I just want to tell you my uh, boss has been hitting on me, but uh, I don't want you to do anything about it. 
right? And the, the Reader's Digest version of our response to that boils down to two quick points. First, anybody who believes that doing nothing is appropriate has to uh, be confronted with the question, what are the odds that doing nothing will solve the problem? Right? Then, of course, from the, that's the practical view. The legal view to reinforce that is you know, we're now on notice of a problem. And when the problem reoccurs, uh, saying, well, this person told us not to do anything is going to be lame and ineffectual. So don't do anything about it. Well, doing nothing means the problem will not get solved but that is an open door to liability. Then there's the, I'll handle it on my own comment, right? Someone says to you, I've got a problem. I'm happy to tell you about it, but I don't want you to do anything. I'll handle it. Okay? Because in the back of your head, you're like, sweet. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> right? uh, the problem with I'll handle it on my own is sometimes the, the short answer is that's the, the organization's obligation. The organization has an obligation to make that conduct stop, especially if it's in the sexual harassment world. But the, the, it, you can't just leave it out there. But often, if the employee says, I'll handle it on my own, it can make the situation worse. Because when they go to handle it, it can cause a, a bigger interaction than had already occurred, or the person will chicken out. They'll say, I'll handle it, and then they realize that that's a scary idea. They don't come back to you to tell you. Then on down the road, they say, you know, I told uh, HR, I told the investigator about my issue, and they did nothing. So the company should handle it. I think there are limited situations where an employee can be given the opportunity to address something. For example, someone says, you know, I have been, um, someone's been asking me out. It's making me uncomfortable. I'd like to tell them no, I haven't really done that. Okay, you can make the determination of whether you think that's a good idea or not, but if they do that, you have to emphasize, you know, that's fine, but just so you know, I'm going to follow back up with you and I'm going to follow up with the person who you are interacting with so that we close the loop. We all always have uh, control of the situation. So another thing that uh, people hear regularly is, you know, uh, keep my name out of this. All right, I don't want you using my name. And the answer is sometimes that can be done depending upon the nature of the allegation, but frequently it can't. And that's when your managers and your supervisors who are frequently the first line of uh, defense and uh, the investigators who are actually following up, they need to know the difference between secrecy and confidentiality because we don't uh, promise anyone secrecy, but we do tell people we can do investigations in a confidential way. But confidentiality doesn't mean we're not going to repeat your name or we're not going to repeat these allegations to another human being. What it means is pe only people who are on a need to know basis are going to be involved in this. And that's an important distinction. Secrecy, no. Confidentiality, yes. And I will tell you that as an in-house person, I remind my HR team of that all the time because it can't hurt because the words are thrown around very uh, imprecisely and I want to make sure no one is promising something that they can't deliver on. The last thing we sometimes hear is someone who says, I've got a problem, but you aren't the right person to handle it. You just don't know what it's like to be a woman working in this department. You don't, what it, you don't know what it's like to be fill in the blank, this age, this religion, this national origin. If you're not ready for that, you could feel, hey, hey, wait a minute, you know, are you saying I don't know what I'm doing? So take a step back. This is, it's good that the person raises it at the outset because on down the road, if they don't, then the whole investigation is kind of tainted because they didn't trust you from the beginning. So sometimes Dealing with that is a matter of talking to that person long enough so that they do understand your background. They do understand that you are a seasoned investigator or, or even if you're not, that you've had training. But you want to do what's best for the investigation. 
So if you think that's a real stumbling block, that you, because of this, aren't the right person, then if you have the ability to find someone else to do it, that's great. And when Doug and I uh, used to sometimes be called upon to do investigations as opposed to be the lawyer for the investigators, we found that especially in the sexual harassment investigation context, having a male and a female do the investigation together was kind of the gold standard, so it took away any of that, that gender uh, issue. So we've talked about the, the meeting with the person who's raising the issue, you're you know, a wizard at asking journalism type questions, but let's take a step back because we still have to figure out if an investigation is even necessary. Before I dig into that, we're going to take questions at the end, but uh, we're happy to entertain a few questions along the way. As and Doug, there was a question from the webinar, uh, dialing back a few slides to the, uh, the point about um, what is a document when you're gathering, uh, gathering the evidence. And, and uh, Alyssa, you talked about uh, emails and text messages and handwritten notes. Uh, the question from uh, one of our participants was, uh, what about social media? I mean, uh -huh. how, how far do you go outside the employer's own systems? So social media is a, is a good one. And I did a training last week for uh, all of our call center employees. And I said, if you are friends on social media with somebody you work with, then all of that is possibly relevant. Because if you're posting racially insensitive comments or um, you know, sexually inappropriate comments, your colleagues can't unsee that. They can't unring the bell on Monday. So um, there, there's a bit of a rule of reason. I mean, companies aren't going around rooting in people's social media, but if it's brought into the workplace, then, then yes, it becomes a part of the investigation just by virtue of the fact that people from work saw what you posted and they associate that with you. And of course, by extension, if you do wind up in litigation, uh, whether you, the employer, affirmatively sought out access to social media, you know, those things may well be uh, discoverable uh, anyway. Uh, so it, I said at the outset, you know, if you get some training, you know things like when do you need to do an investigation because investigators uh, should start with that uh, question. Uh, and to boil it down, we're talking about doing investigations when there are facts in dispute about something significant, right? Facts that are in dispute about something significant. And I, I like to reduce this back or use as an example the story that we became familiar with years ago about 12 engineers who are working together in a tightly knit group. These 12 engineers, all male, all single, all uh, uh, between the ages of about 25 and 29. What subject do you think came up regularly in their banter among themselves at work? That's right. You know, begins with S, ends with X. And lucky engineer number 13 who joins the group is a woman who about four nanoseconds into her first day on the job is grossly offended by all the sexual banter. And she goes to the supervisor and says, look, I think this is a terrific opportunity. I'm really glad for the job, but I have to tell you, I'm really offended by all the sexual stuff going on in the group. The supervisor goes to HR and tells HR what the woman said. And HR says, well, is it true? And the supervisor says, well, yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I hear it all the time. Question. Do they need to do an investigation? And the answer is no. Why? Because there are no facts in dispute. That supervisor had all the facts that he needed, right? He knew them. Now, do you need to do something to correct the situation? Sure, but that's separate from the question of do you need to do an investigation? Uh, we point out. Let me stop you right there just to, so you can clarify one thing. So, since you've been using a lot of examples in the sexual harassment area, and you guys know this a lot better than I do, but. My understanding is that certain types of sexual harassment, like uh, the boss says, you know, you go out with me or I'm not going to give you a raise or promotion. We call uh, that that's sleep with me or else. Right. That, that, that's a quid pro, pro quo harassment that creates basically automatic liability for the employer. Of course, the individual harasser can be held personally liable, but the employer is kind of automatically liable. Whereas in your example about, you know, the young guys in the workroom creating 
kind of a hostile work environment for other employees, especially female employees. That sort of harassment, my understanding, doesn't create automatic strict liability for the employer, but if the employer learns about it, someone higher up, and doesn't do anything about it, then they can be held liable. So this is kind of beyond the investigation part. In terms of that corrective action in those situations, you want to speak to that for a minute? Well, I think Jeff makes two points. One is uh, it's true that not every act of a hostile environment by itself uh, necessarily creates legal liability. Uh, Having said that, we're talking about investigating misconduct in the workplace, and in our view, sexually inappropriate conversation, whether it rises to the level of being a sexually hostile environment, is still inappropriate. And of course, we want to stop misconduct at the stage where it's just inappropriate before it reaches the level of being, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating legal liability. So in the 12 engineer situation, of course, that conduct needed to be addressed and stopped, even if there was a good argument that would have said, it doesn't create a sexually hostile environment under the law yet. And to Jeff's point, he was talking about this quid pro quo automatic liability versus in a hostile environment situation, the standard of no or should have known, right? It's a, it's a lower standard. Once the company knows or should have known, they need to take action to make the conduct stop. So one of the things... Uh, well, one more, a new question yeah. from the webinar. So what if this information about whether it's a hostile environment or a quid pro quo or any other offending conduct comes third hand? So the employee who's dealing, has the real problem, talks to her friend or colleague, complains about it, uh, but says, don't say anything. That person then goes to the supervisor to inform them of the situation, but doesn't say who it is. You know, clearly the employer has put on some kind of notice that something is going on. What's the obligation or or your advice in that right in this situation? Well, when you learn about it from a third party, that's the security guard story, right? The woman who got sexually assaulted who didn't complain, but she told her boyfriend and the boyfriend told the company. Now the company was on notice and it did the right thing in getting an investigator uh, to look into it. As a practical matter, there are sometimes constraints on what an investigator can do if the, quote, victim of the misconduct isn't willing to own the complaint or to participate, that's, that, that's a 20-minute segment by itself. But, uh, but the point is, once you have reason to believe that misconduct may have occurred, you're going to do all you reasonably can, that's all you reasonably can, to get the facts necessary to figure out what actually happened and does what actually happened warrant some kind of corrective action. And if somebody won't talk to you, make sure you document that That's right. so that you've got a record of what you tried to do. I want to say uh, let's move on. Uh, on another day, we'll tell you the story about our favorite uh, expert involvement in a case because there are some things only an expert can help you sort out like what is the bodily fluid on the towel that the employee gives you saying it's evidence of an inappropriate relationship that she and her supervisor had. The only way you will get me to tell you that story after this program is if you ask me. (laughs) The investigator needs to figure out what witnesses uh, uh, you need to talk to and what order do you talk to people in because the order that you talk to witnesses in is very important. Most people's inclination is to say, I want to talk to all the witnesses first and then get to the the subject of the investigation, get to the accused. Sometimes that's appropriate, but much more often than you would think, the prudent way to go is to get to the subject of the investigation as quickly as possible. And one of the primary reasons you want to do that is What is it that we're investigating? Facts that are in dispute. Until we talk to the subject of the investigation, what don't we know? What we don't know is what facts are actually in dispute. When the subject of the investigation says, yes, I did A, B, and C, yes, I said X, Y, and Z, those things are no longer in dispute. They may need to be addressed, but they're not in dispute. 
And what we're trying to accomplish is to keep the circle of people involved in the investigation as small as possible because one of the things we're trying to minimize is our risk for liability for defamation. And the defamation problem gets enhanced when more people who more people learn about the investigation than who need to know about it. So we keep the circle smaller as best we can, as frequently as we can, by talking to the subject of the investigation before we go talk to other witnesses. Questioning witnesses raises other kinds of issues and other scenarios. So we talk generally about meeting with the person who raised the complaint, asking open-ended questions, not drawing a conclusion. And I see it is everyone's natural inclination to talk to witnesses, to talk to the subject of the investigation with uh, their conclusion in mind. And if there's any way that you can remember before meeting with a witness, keep an open mind, then all the better. Because you're not going to necessarily listen as well if you're just listening for things that corroborate your point of view. So, okay, the easy stuff is talking to the person who raised the complaint, right? You don't have any information yet, so you can't mess it up yet, right? You're just gathering stuff. Then you've got to figure out, okay, am I talking to the subject of the investigation next? That's a tough interview, right? That's a stressful part of the process because that person is not going to be super happy to talk to you. They're going to be angry. Um, you're going to hear things like, I'm not talking to you, I deny it, and there are ways to deal with all of that. But uh, one thing that is helpful for me and what I always recommend to people is to have a good outline for yourself of that meeting or teach your investigators to have a good outline, not a list of questions. If you've got a list of questions, you're going to be so wedded to that list that you're just going to be ticking those off and you're not going to listen, you're not going to explore the tangents to figure out, okay, what's really going on. So I, I understand this is a stressful part of the process. You should have an outline. You're going to have to deal with anger. You're going to have to deal with rage, all kinds of things. And I want to talk through uh, a couple ways this could go. Now, this first way that it could go, this isn't even the hardest interview because this is just with the manager of the person who raised the issue. So this is not the person being accused. So how might this go? So uh, Alyssa, what's going on? Uh, Bob, have you talked to Diane lately about any problems she's been having? Well, yeah, I mean, she came to me a while ago. She said she was having personal trouble with somebody at work, but she didn't want to tell me who it was, so there wasn't anything I could do. <sighs> Bob, did you not attend sexual harassment training when we did it? We warned everyone of the consequences of failing to report this. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, all of a sudden it sounds like I'm in trouble here. So what do you think, right? Not the way to go, right? But, I mean, it's an obvious reaction by her, but you can see what happens when all of a sudden the guy who probably has some helpful information begins to feel like he's not exactly advancing his own career prospects by answering your question. So that's the problem. Uh, another scenario, uh, now you are talking to the subject of the investigation, to the accused. Uh, think about how that might go. So uh, if I say, so uh, what's up? Joe, we've got a problem. Diane told me you've been sexually harassing her. She said she, sexually, well, I mean, that's, that's just bullshit. That's bullshit. How do you think she did, right? It's as if I've never even learned about how to do an investigation. That's right. Been through the program 200 times, still doesn't know how to answer, how to ask a question. Uh, you see what happens, and what are the odds of getting any kind of uh, decent response, any valuable response, once you've backed the person off into it's bullshit, it's all bullshit, to use the legal expression. All right. It's just a sampling of the kinds of things that people need to be alert to because there's something to know about how to ask these kinds of questions. And the, the loaded term, the sexual harassment, I always train everybody to not use, right? That's, that's your conclusion, right? You go in there looking for sexual harassment. So terms like that, you should, you know, talk them through before you do the investigation and remember to strike them when you're actually asking questions. 
So who's lying and who's telling the truth? Assessing credibility is, of course, a big part of these investigations. We all think, or most of us think, that we're pretty good at being judges of human nature and integrity, and most of us are at best 50-50 on that. But there are some things that people can learn to help them in doing these investigations. And we put a number of the elements uh, in the PowerPoint. Uh, I actually want to focus just quickly on the last one. Uh, I will do injustice to the first three. But uh, you know, the last one is important because there's direct evidence and then there's everything else. And so direct evidence is, yes, I said that, or you know, yes, I heard him say it, or yes, I saw her do it. Uh, that's fine. But what about all the other stuff? What about circumstantial evidence? What is that? How will you know it when you experiencing it? When you experience it, Alyssa's going to talk to you about it. So there's a restaurant in a college town, and the restaurant has 29 waitresses, and they all wear skimpy little tops and short little shorts, and it's not the restaurant you're thinking of. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you where it is. But there are a lot of male college-age patrons who come to this restaurant. And so there's a lot of banter and joking, and they're asking people out, a lot of uh, sexual innuendo, all that. It's like a walking hormone factory. Into this setting comes waitress number 30. And one day, waitress number 30 is standing on a step stool erasing the specials board for the next day. And for those of you who are on the phone, I am moving my hand up and down in an erasing type fashion. And the manager walks up beside her and says, hey, I like that up and down motion. Why don't you come back to my place and you can practice that? So waitress number 30 does not say anything to him, but she turns around on her step stool and gives him the look of death, which even if you've never seen it, I believe you would recognize it. And in sexual harassment terms, it means that was an unwelcome comment. Says nothing else. A couple days later, they're having a wine tasting at the restaurant um, so that the staff will know what kind of wine to recommend with what kind of food, and it's also you know, a little staff morale thing. The manager comes up to waitress number 30 and says to her, hey, I see you like wine. Why don't you come back to my place and I'll make you wine? Shockingly enough, waitress number 30 does not go back to his place. Where she does go is down to the EEOC, where she files an EEOC charge. So first, the EEOC gets her story. Then they talk to him and he does what? Denies it. Then they talk to the waitresses. Let's say for the sake of this story, they talk to all 29 waitresses. What's the first question they ask the waitresses? Did you see it or did you hear it? Were you an eyewitness? All 29 of the waitresses say no. The next question they ask is, has he ever done anything like this to you? Every single one of them says, oh yeah, this guy, he's hilarious. He's always talking about his sexual exploits, and he goes out over the weekend and then tells us about what he did, and he's joking. One woman actually said, this is the funnest place I've ever worked. Now, let's leave their judgment aside about, you know, their workplace. So, do we know for sure he did those things to waitress number 30? He said those things? No. Do we have a uh, reasonable conclusion that he said those things? Yeah, sure, that's circumstantial evidence. It's not direct evidence, but it's evidence that tends to lead you in one direction or another, circumstantial evidence. It's the way discrimination cases get proven all the time, and that's a higher standard. That's a preponderance of the evidence standard in court. Right? If somebody says, I was passed up for promotion um, because I'm gay and sexual orientation discrimination, you don't have the manager saying, to somebody, I'm passing him up for promotion because he's gay. What you have is jokes, comments, the fact that uh, he's been there longer and he's gotten good evaluations and somebody else was promoted. That's all circumstantial. 
So like Doug said at the beginning, you know, we reject the notion that someone says, I just can't make up my mind. I hear all the time, well, I didn't know there was, it's a he said, she said. And then we take a step back and say, well, what do you have? What have you got from your investigation? Let's make a decision based on the circumstantial evidence. So now we're going to talk a little bit about collecting up other kinds of information besides just from talking to people. We call it where can you look and what can you take. And uh, I want to say a word about electronically stored information at this point. And again, we will do serious injustice to the topic because ESI is much of the ball game frequently for many of these kinds of investigations. And either through your own internal resources or through outside help that you get one way or another, uh, we need to know how to search for our electronically stored information, how to collect it, how to analyze it, and we need to have somebody involved who understands the significance of metadata for many kinds of issues in these investigations. Metadata, the information about the information in these electronic files, uh, will be critical. Uh, and more and more, we need to have people who understand the difference between application data, system metadata, uh, and what do we do when we have reason to believe that elect electronically stored information may be at the heart of an investigation. There's an impulse sometimes for uh, people to say, well, let's go in the files and look and see what's there. And I am frequently saying to clients, no. Leave the files alone for now. Opening a file may change the metadata. It may give it a last edited date. It may do other things to the metadata, which would be tantamount to changing around evidence at the scene of a crime. We want to leave that alone until we get qualified people in who know how to preserve metadata and then enable us to do the kinds of searches we need to do. We also need to be thinking about the equivalent of litigation hold memos to make sure that we're preserving and instructing people not to delete the kind of electronically stored information that might be relevant in our uh, investigation. But I, I will say that you don't always have to go overboard. I mean, I, I've worked with HR. Well, well, we never have to go overboard. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I've worked with HR on a lot of small investigations where we have looked at particular emails, we have looked at someone's inbox or sent mail or whatever, and we did not have to go all those additional steps. So it really does depend on the investigation you're doing. I mean, it, it's not always the, um, you know, the Cadillac of investigations. So what about people taking notes during an investigation? Wait, wait, before we move on from that, um, Doug, I might want to advance the, uh, the rest of the slide. Um, the, the second bullet point here on this slide speaks to uh, privacy. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, Alyssa, but I think it's worth, I mean, we've done entire programs on this topic before, as some of you know, in terms of uh, employees' electronic communications and what is kind of fair game for an employer to look at and what isn't. And when you're looking at employee, potential employee misconduct, I um, mean, you're trying to create an evidence trail of what transpired and what didn't, and there's not a lot of visual or verbal eyewitnesses, you know, what happened electronically is often critical. Um, that being said, uh, I'll, as you guys have seen even much more than I have, a lot of the most inappropriate communications may not occur through the classic employer you know, email system, but may uh, occur on personal devices, perhaps that are provided by the employer, may occur via text message on an employer provided device, or may incur, uh, occur on employees' own personal devices uh, that may be in part or in part in part or not at all, um, you know, subsidized or paid for by the employer. So can you, if you had to kind of at a high level, summarize the basic rules, and, 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 and these rules are, are constantly evolving, of course, and they also vary on a state-by-state -state basis depending on where the employee is located. Um, 
but speak a little bit to kind of what's fair game and what's not in terms of where you can look at all. I mean, the first thing to think about is do you have an IT policy or some kind of policy that gives that puts people on notice that you that nothing on their company systems are private? I mean, that that's the best because if you are uh, providing a company phone or tablet, or if you're subsidizing a company phone or tablet, hopefully it says somewhere you shouldn't have any expectation of privacy, even if you're using this for personal use. If you're communicating uh, with colleagues, then um, it's fair game for us. Now, we're not talking internationally uh, so much. I mean, that's a whole different ball of wax. Now, our policies do say internationally we can do the same thing, but you better believe I would look up the country law um, if I had to look before, before looking. Um, and that's, that's with respect to the policy. I believe in California this, it's still the case that you have to give someone actual notice in addition to the policy, actual notice if you're going to look through their emails, um, which is a little awkward because if you're doing an investigation and you want to do it without them knowing, you've got to figure out how to do that. I think that's still uh, the current state of the law was the last time I looked. And Alyssa touched on this in part of what she said, but the uh, bring your own device phenomenon uh, just puts all these issues uh, front and center. And uh, these are hard because, and I've been through this with clients where we say, you, know, you ought to say to people, you're welcome to use your own stuff, but it means we're going to get to look at it. And goes, well, but we don't want people thinking we're going to be looking through everything on their phone. Well, if they're using their phone for work, right? All of those uh, elements are in it. Sometimes there's a technological fix, you know, the, the, the software that we have, uh, you know, this is my personal phone, and Venable puts the, the good program on here, so my law firm emails go through that, and the firm could, if it ever decided to do so, look at my work emails without getting to the rest of my personal stuff, and there are ways to do that. And that's all in the privacy mix. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the employer would have they might, if you have the right policy in place, and like Alyssa said, that's usually critical. It all starts with making sure there's no expectation of privacy created on any employer-provided device, machine, right. equipment, or anything that the employer is paying for, um, including, for, you know, perhaps putting, say, the good program on your iPhone so that you can access your emails. Certainly in that situation with the right policy, depending on state law, you, the employer should be able to access your emails through your device. But at the same time, if it's your personal device and you're also sending text messages on there and you're paying for that phone, even if the employer tried to take the position that you were put on notice, it's probably a good argument that the employee would have an expectation of privacy with respect to their text messages. It gets murkier. The good news is somebody received those messages. So if the person who, I mean, I mean you, you know, you, you try the best you can to get the information, and it depends on the scope of your investigation how much you're going to try. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's trickier when it's text. And I think it goes both ways, because uh, if you can make the argument that there is some work connection to what's going on, then, then you've got that. And the flip side is employers have gotten into trouble where, employees were able to show that there was no legitimate basis for the employer continuing to look through emails which were obviously of a personal nature. It, it, it and, goes and, and, and let's go even beyond that. So let's say you, you're, you, you suspect that, that one of your employees is, uh, is, is a bigot, is a racist, and in addition to trying to search his emails and perhaps his text messages, that you also decide to try to get access you know, to Facebook. someone who is a friend of his on Facebook yeah. so you could see what kind of you know, groups he belongs to, what kind of messages he's posting, kind of try well, to draw. I know it's very difficult where to draw these lines, and again, it's very state-specific, and if you're in California, uh, a lot more employee protections than anywhere else. So I was just going to talk about Facebook, because I did have a situation a couple of years ago where somebody was out on leave, uh, FMLA leave, because they had some kind of leg injury and couldn't walk and whatever, and some manager said, hey, you know, she posted these pictures of herself last week walking around Paris. So, okay. Um, so Facebook, it's, it's interesting. L lately, I mean, I, I tend to want to gather more rather than less information, so I always look people up on Facebook, and half the time, they're not uh, private. So you can find that stuff without, I mean, the person set it up that way without an expectation of privacy. I think in that circumstance, 
if anyone could look, then I think the employer can certainly look. The situation that's a little dicier is when somebody doesn't have a, a, a public Facebook, but you, you know someone who's a friend of theirs and that person's a manager and you say, hey, would you look for me? I've had people, I've had managers say no. I don't feel comfortable with that and I have left it at that. But I have a few times asked someone to look at someone's Facebook postings. And it, it's, it's very challenging. Like you don't want to necessarily just kind of go rooting through things, but you don't want to not pay attention, especially if it comes up in an investigation. If someone says, gee, Jim posted XYZ on Facebook and that's offensive to me as a fill in the blank. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And uh, just two things to keep in mind that we've got to move on. One is the guidance that Alyssa and Doug are giving here on this issue is specific to kind of doing an investigation of an existing employee. The, the basic ground rules and guidance and counsel we would provide would be different if we're talking about, say, a prospective employee in the hiring process. Um, and in terms of what kind of background checking you're doing, what kind of, and some states have even made it illegal to ask, you know, to require prospective employees to provide uh, Facebook and other social media login information. And there's a lot of other, even without that state-specific laws, there's a lot of dangers of doing that. So the advice and counsel we're giving at this end doesn't necessarily apply on the front end. And I am also not advocating ever asking someone for their Facebook or social media login information. I'm talking about finding it on your own. Yeah. And then the other thing I just want to point out is we have done several of these uh, webinars and programs exactly in these topics, one on bring your own device policies and one on kind of the employee hiring process in the nonprofit context. So if you want to get a lot more information on this, you can look at those recorded webinars. All right, why don't we uh, move on? So in terms of, of note taking, right, the, the person who's doing the investigation is going to take notes. And if you're someone like me, you write down everything all the time, and I type everything. If it's your practice to type everything, that's fine. If it's your practice to handwrite, that's fine. A lot of times we get the question of, well, I handwrite my notes, and then I retype them right away because my handwriting is horrendous. Can I throw away the handwritten copy of the notes? And the answer is maybe. If it's really an exact copy, of the notes and it's your practice to always do that, okay. But if not, I would keep them because you don't want in uh, litigation to have a situation where they're like, well, you know, you say you, you gave us this nice typed up thing, but the real evidence is in the notes and you threw away the notes and all of a sudden you've got Watergate over the notes. So, um, so throw away the notes only if you really did duplicate them. Assume the notes that are being taken are discoverable uh, if you're doing the investigation, even if you're a lawyer, the, the, uh, and Doug's going to talk about that in a minute, uh, you're the investigator and it's, they're discoverable, so you should advise your investigators to write them in a way that they would be okay having somebody else see them. And then people sometimes ask, well, why, can't, why do I have to take notes? I hate taking notes. Can't I just tape record the conversation? And our view is that it's not a great idea. Um, even if in the state that you're in it's okay to have uh, a tape recording, it doesn't uh, make for a very comfortable environment when you're saying, just tell me what happened, speak clearly, and speak into the microphone. It has a chilling effect on the situation. And certainly if, if you're talking to someone over the phone and you hear like clicking and whirring, feel free to ask them if they're taping. And stop the interview until they confirm that they're not. Because you certainly don't want to be taped without your knowledge or without your consent. So um, note taking, everyone's sort of least favorite part of the process, but crucial down the road when, uh, if there's litigation. And, and we've, we've mentioned a number of times uh, state-specific laws. Um, the recording issue is one where some states do not allow one party to tape without the other party's consent. So even if you think you have a great opportunity to gather evidence, say from the accused, doing some surreptitious tape recording, you have to be very careful in, in that regard. And it, it, just, it just points out the fact that there are many state laws in these areas that differ wildly from state to state, so you have to be very cognizant of that. And also keep in mind, we see it more and more with so many employees that work remotely and, and telecommute or, or, or exclusively work from their residences. We have even small nonprofits, large nonprofits that have employees all across the country. These state laws apply to the employees where the employees are located. So right. even if it's a single employee working in California and the nonprofit is based here in D.C., 
depending on the threshold of how those laws apply to the number of employees and whatnot, there's a good chance, for instance, that California employment laws are going to apply to the employee in California. Yeah, let me be clear on this notion that in a given state, uh, recording without the other person's consent might be legal. I am st still strongly inclined against doing it and have counsel clients that way, uh, largely because I think there's an unseemliness to it. And remember what it is we're trying to accomplish here, which is to do a good faith investigation and to appear to have done a good faith investigation. And I think a recording without consent cuts against that. There are circumstances in which I can imagine it would be justifiable and a smart thing to do, but uh, you've got to make that case to me before I would go in that direction. In our few remaining minutes together, I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, it is essential to be thinking about the attorney-client privilege from the outset of an investigation. For one thing, if there are uh, any uh, reasons to believe that the investigation is going the direction of a criminal matter, uh, then you certainly want your lawyer involved at the outset. There are times when it is the prudent thing to do to put an entire investigation under the protection of the attorney-client privilege. You need your lawyer's advice about that at the outset. You can't do it retroactively once you've started having communications outside the privilege. Those are not going to be protected by the attorney-client uh, privilege. Uh, we want investigators to understand what legal resources they have available to them and how to use them smartly during an investigation because there may well be things that need to be discussed during an investigation that ought to be protected by the attorney-client privilege. And there certainly there are likely to be documents that will need to be created that at least in their draft form uh, should be uh, under the attorney-client privilege. Having said this, once again, state law varies on when the attorney-client privilege will apply and how it will apply. Uh, and different states are, are scoring this differently and giving the attorney-client privilege much less uh, scope than it had in the past or one would think it has. So that's just one more that you need to be uh, talking to your lawyer about. Doug, before you move on to the next slide, uh, just to make sure everyone understands this, generally the attorney-client privilege is the protection that a client gets uh, in connection with legal advice that's provided by their attorney. So the attorney is providing some legal advice to the client. If the scope of that advice stays within uh, the client and the attorney, could be other attorneys in the same law firm, could be other uh, employees or officers or directors of the same client, same or nonprofit organization, but if it stays within that circle, what that means is that advice is going to be fully protected and no plaintiff in a lawsuit or government agency conducting an investigation or anyone else can compel disclosure of that information. So if the client chooses to keep that confidential and protected, it can. What we're talking about here, even beyond that, is where an attorney is conducting an investigation, and it's one of the reasons why we often uh, encourage for the attorney to be the one either conducting or advising and counseling on the investigation, then the facts gathered in that investigation also will be covered and protected by the attorney client privilege. This is so critical because when you first start out, and Alyssa was giving an example, if you don't know what really transpired, what the key facts are, you don't know what it's going to implicate. You know, A, you may need to protect some of this information in the event that your nonprofit ends up getting sued or an action brought against it by the you know, uh, U.S. Department of Labor or State Department of Labor or the EEOC, and you may not want all of these bad facts to be disclosed because it may create more liability risk for your organization. In addition, we often see where the offending conduct of an employee may say rise to the, rise to the level of some kind of procurement fraud. Uh, or in, improper uh, 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 actions that could implicate you know, the organization's federal tax exempt status or some antitrust liability uh, or all of the various rules regarding the use of federal funds and grants and cooperative agreements and contracts. And in all of these things, what the information that you gathered, you don't want to be forced to have to turn it over to the Inspector General's office from USAID who's going to come knocking on your door several months later when they hear and learn about some sort of procurement fraud. And we've been involved in these situations, and it doesn't mean that you're going to bury information and not properly disclose it when you have an 
an obligation to, to the relevant federal agency. You certainly will to the extent you have to, but it doesn't mean you, you need to disclose all of it necessarily. You want to be able to package it up and disclose it in the way that's most beneficial and favorable to your organization. But you don't get to do any of this if you don't have the protection of the attorney-client privilege. When we're talking about getting to the end of the investigation, the single biggest thing we worry about is the investigator who, who has done all of this and then acts like the investigator in the security guard investigation. So we are constantly harping on those who are doing the investigation. Don't be afraid to reach a conclusion because you're afraid of being wrong. Right. If the investigation has been done properly, uh, the question is, have you reached a conclusion that you can support? Have you reached a conclusion that seems reasonable? Picture the 12 people you're standing with online at the supermarket, you know, the jury. Would your conclusion sound reasonable to them? That's the standard we're going for. Uh, we're at the end game, and that's as good a time as any to take just a minute to talk about documentation, which is another subject where we will have spent two minutes on it today, but of course is huge in uh, the conduct of an investigation. But it's also a good time to harken back to something Alyssa said about electronically stored information. This is all a matter of judgment, right? If you left it to the lawyers, we would document every time everybody in the investigation inhaled and exhaled because that would give us a great documented record of what's gone on. That would be great from the legal perspective and of course nobody would be getting any work done. So seriously, it's a judgment call that we make with clients all the time. You meet with the person who's bringing you the complaint. Are you gonna do a follow-up memo of that meeting? There are all kinds of reasons that one ought to do that. And sometimes organizations have their own reasons for saying, no, we're not going to make that investment in the process or not make that investment for this kind of complaint. What we can tell you is this. When you are thinking about whether a document should be done, if you have the misfortune to be a person who is documenting pieces of the investigation and you're gritting your teeth and you're bemoaning your faith that you have to do it, I want you to keep an image in mind. Somebody is gonna wind up unhappy with this investigation, and the unhappy person is gonna to go to a lawyer, and the lawyer's gonna say, tell me what happened. Oh, those no good bastards, they did this, they did that, they fired me. The lawyer's gonna say, did they give you anything in writing to explain why they did what they did? I said, yeah, this, and so that, former employee is going to hand that lawyer a document that you created in the investigation. And I want you to think about the response that that lawyer is going to have to what you wrote. Because the response you want is for the lawyer to be reading it and thinking, this is pretty good. Right? These people were serious. They knew what they were doing. They asked the right questions. They, they documented it properly. And when that lawyer gets finished reading that memo or that letter and puts it down and says, thanks, but I'm not taking cases like yours today, then you really earned your keep and the investment in that document, of course, has paid off in you know, many times beyond the value of the time that you spent writing it. That's why we document things. So of course it's a judgment call, but that's the image to have in mind. It's the audience beyond the employee who you're giving the document. To. And I will say, um, I work with my HR folks all the time and I review as close to sort of everything that they do in an investigation as I can. So we will go back and forth on drafts. I will bloody the document as if I were a ninth grade English teacher. They know that they should not get offended by that. But recently we did one. It was a, not, not a complicated investigation, but we did the, the final document was a memo that went to the employee. And then he ultimately was fired, filed an EEOC charge. And the, the memo was so well crafted that the EEOC charge was basically intro paragraph, here's the memo, summary paragraph. And it, is, it takes a long time to do a good investigation um, memo, but it's, it really is worth it. And I usually end up with two. 
one that's a summary of the investigation just for the file, and then one that uh, goes to the employee just so that there's some kind of record. Not always, and again, you have to figure out what's appropriate for the situation, but, but it's often really worth it in the long run, even though it's like a major nightmare while you're doing it. Yeah, I would, I would assume that in not in every situation does the same thing that you're effectively publicly disclosing equal the same thing that you're keeping for your oh, own record. Oh, absolutely. That's why I said maybe privileged information and the other that you're not yeah. going to disclose. Oh. Let me ask you, in a situation, say, where there is no disclosed memo at the end of the process, but we get the question a lot, to, uh, the person who originally brought the complaint, um, to what extent do you keep he or she informed throughout the process and at the end of the process? What are your thoughts on that? We treat these matters as confidential personnel matters. So the question is, the person who brought you the complaint, uh, what's their right to know what's happened? Well, it's not a matter of what they have a right to know. Question is, what's the prudent thing to do? So sometimes the answer is, we looked into your, uh, your complaint and the matter's been resolved. And sometimes it's, we looked into your complaint and we found that your uh, allegations had merit or, or not, or some combination. And sometimes it's, uh, it's a confidential personnel matter, but starting tomorrow, John will no longer be your supervisor. John will no longer be employed at the company. Those are factual statements. And why am I saying that? Because what I'm thinking about as we're trying to figure out for the client what's the right response, what is it? We're back to the D word. We're back to defamation. Okay. So to say, to go the next step and say we fired John because we believe he engaged in sexual harassment. Okay, now you've made an allegation against him and you know, we don't want to fight that allegation again, but John then says, oh, now you defamed me because now you were telling people I engaged in sexual harassment and I'm going to challenge you on that. We'd rather keep it at the factual level. We, you know, we investigated and he's no longer your supervisor. People can draw their own inferences, but that's different from the words that we speak. Uh, so there's no one-size-fits-all answer to Jeff's question. It does vary based upon particulars of the circumstances, but that's what we're concerned about, trying to keep it as narrow as we can, while still giving the employee who may be legitimately aggrieved the confidence to know that their complaint was taken seriously. And uh, we have addressed the situation such that that person doesn't have any legitimate concern going forward. And as for the witnesses, you say thank you very much because they uh, always want to know the gossip of the workplace, and that's not what we're in the business of sharing. And just to put a little finer point on this, in connection with these investigations, what tends to happen is a lot of times there are some very legitimate accusations that later end up being substantiated. But there's also, there's a lot of emotions flying around. There's a lot of accusations that are perhaps unfounded, unproven by any, any, any standard of proof. And the problem, and when Doug talks about defamation, what he's saying is that if there are negative, untrue things said or alleged about someone, and that gets out kind of beyond that control group, of you know, the, the key employees and legal counsel and officers that have a need to know and are in what we call a control group for, for privilege purposes. And if it gets out to other employees or the general public and harms that employee's reputation, that can cause great defamation liability to the organization. And that's why it's so critical to maintain the confidentiality of all this information. That's right. Repeating an allegation of, say, sexual harassment is itself an act of defamation. The law provides us protection, however, by saying, well, if you do it properly, then you have a qualified immunity uh, against any liability. But you can blow that immunity by not acting appropriately to limit the number of people who hear the allegations. There's a question over there. Yeah. Uh, wait, just uh, if you can wait for the microphone for a second. Hmm? Um, hi, this might go without saying, but I just want to double check. I work with very small organizations, so very bare bones policies. I've seen policies about if there's a complaint, it will be investigated, but very little explanation of what that means. Okay. I think what I'm hearing you say is it might not be a bad idea to put some minimal blurbs in there like you will receive a written response mm -hmm. just I, to show fair. I wouldn't because then when you don't do it, 
the first time you investigate something, um, then your policy doesn't comply with how you actually do it. I mean, I, I would say more along the lines of we will investigate as is appropriate under the circumstances, because like Doug said, sometimes an investigation is not even necessary. I, I routinely edit yeah. client policies where they say, we're going to investigate every complaint. I say, no, we're not. Right. We're going to investigate complaints where there are things in dispute about something important, and that's our judgment. And if we exercise it properly, we'll be okay, and otherwise, no. But, no, I think much more important is policies that, that uh, encourage people to bring legitimate complaints when they've got them. Yeah, there, there are – in the employment context, just like in other legal contexts in the nonprofit world, there are some times where having a written policy on something is critically important and in and itself provides you certain defenses and legal rights. But there are other areas – where, and this is a perfect example, if you have a policy that's too specific and prescriptive, that if you don't follow it every time, you actually create potential liability for your organization. So you need to find that, that proper line. At the same time, it is critically important that every time you get an accusation or an allegation that you do something about it because of that new or should have known standard. Uh, but as long as the policy makes sure that you do that without going further, you're probably in a good place. All right. Well. Uh, as we are at the uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time mark, I want to thank uh, Doug and Alyssa for a terrific presentation. Thanks to all of you for participating, and we uh, hope to see you back here next month. Thank you very much.